Hello there. Uh, as advertised, this is the live with teacher Marlon, his name. Uh, didn't say it in his profile. So, yeah, we're live here. Just going to invite my uh, guest through here. So, uh, hope everyone's well. So I should have my guest entering soon. Uh, to just discuss our careers and what we do. Hopefully, plenty of good things for you to learn as a teacher or as a student of a language. Hopefully, we can have a conversation that is is interesting for the English learning community, teachers and uh, students alike. So yeah, I'm just waiting for Marlon to enter and we'll start our discussion. Thank you for any live listeners. This will be saved on my profile. It will also be on YouTube uh, in time with subtitles. Wait a minute. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just trying to get my guest to enter. He'll be in soon. Okay, yeah, there he is. Hey, I just need to switch the camera, yeah. I guess. There yeah, we go. Uh, happy <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good afternoon. Uh, the afternoon now, I think. Just hi there. Why the seconds? I think I've I don't know. Uh, music started to play all of the sudden here, but it's <laughs> it's okay. That's fine. I went with I fine. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the comments and viewership. So, oh, what's that? Uh, my name is Gareth. Uh, if you follow my. Um, Instagram, any amount of time, you may have seen a few little videos, a lot of photos. So I'm from Leeds, so it's a city in the centre north of England. I've been living in Salvador Bahia in northeast Brazil for about five and a half years. I started my English teaching here. So in England, I was a personal trainer, I'm gym manager. I changed careers when I moved here. So. That's me. Uh, what about you, Marlon? Can you tell me a little bit of information about yourself? Yeah, uh, if you allow me to just uh, confirm a few details on what you said. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you've been living in Brazil, in uh, Salvador, Bahia, for yep. nearly five years. Five and a half years. That's a lot. And how's your Portuguese? My Portuguese is spoken... Portuguese is better than my written because I didn't actually study academically. Um, done some classes. I can read scientific articles in Portuguese quite mm. well because I've mm. practiced. So I don't just do classes, I do translations. So I do some translations of scientific articles. So a very scientific background in England. So it's the Portuguese article into English. It's more difficult the other way around for me because I wouldn't notice mistakes if they happened. And you do in English because I've read a lot of scientific articles in English mm. in a past uh, academic background. So that's that's uh, one part of Portuguese I can read and write quite well. It's scientific stuff I read quite a bit, but academically speaking, I would struggle to pass written exams in Portuguese, maybe. But speaking, I have a lot of practice. I do a lot of listening, so mm. I, I have more need for conversational Portuguese than academic, the way things are. And when I do academic work, it's mm -hmm. putting it into English language. So I do speak, uh, but reading, my, but writing well. Uh, there's even Brazilians that struggle to write well properly, because that's yeah, a different thing altogether. Right. So it's, it's not really what I've done. It was TV. Talking to people, uh, having problem solving. So, like 
if you want to learn English and you have the financial capability to do a an exchange in an English speaking country. I've like had a five and a half year exchange to learn Portuguese from nothing. <laughs> so, so they don't teach it in schools in England because Portugal is one of the smallest countries in Europe. So the most dominant language in our schools is French. I studied French. And then after French, there's Spanish or German as the sort of second alternative in other schools. But that, that, uh, that's something new to me. You're saying that the most predominant language in England, in some foreign countries? Language. Foreign language. Oh, okay. So the, the modern foreign language, obviously English is the native language. You take that for granted. But okay. in terms of studying a foreign language at school, your options are French, maybe German or Spanish. Mm -hmm. Obviously, France is the closest country to us that doesn't speak English, so mm -hmm. that's quite logical. Spain, big country. Germany, economically powerful, also quite big. Uh, Portugal, small. Italy, small, so their language doesn't get into our schools as much, for example. Uh, Russian, in some very fancy schools. There's a lot of Russians to talk to, but it's not very common. My dad studied Russian, but he went to a grammar school, so he'd passed an exam. Uh, it's a bit like um, a bit like a vestibular, but before school, it was called an 11 plus. When you were a, before you start high school, which starts at 11 in England, you used to be able to take an exam. If you get a good grade, you could go to a better school. I never took this exam. It wasn't as big, and I don't know if I'd have ever got into a better school, but my dad did. So it's very rare. Very rare somebody learns Russian, but it's possible. It, it's there. But French is number one, and then number two and three joint is German or Spanish generally in schools. Mm -hmm. So access to Portuguese language in England doesn't exist. So the little advantage you have learning English in Brazil to a, a British person learning Portuguese is the exposure to materials in English. You have uh, uh, you have Netflix and stuff, you have films that are already in English language. Music's very popular from English-speaking countries. There is a lot of Brazilian music that's good and I like, but I never heard any of it in England. Really? I think that, yeah, uh, very few people have heard Brazilian music before. Masconada mm -hmm. is quite famous. People will recognize that as being a Brazilian song. Like Sergio Mendes, Masconada. That's been on, I think they can Mas what? Masconada. Ah, Masconada, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, that song's famous, and you'll probably hear that when Brazil play football and it's on the TV, you'll have that on in the introduction. That's been in, that's always the background music if they go to Brazil in a film. So that's, everyone knows this song's Brazilian. Most people can't name it, but everybody knows it's Brazilian. And People old enough to remember Frank Sinatra will know Tom Jobim because of their duet. Uh -huh. But most people don't really know. So you don't have the exposure of anything in Portuguese. The, the only film, uh, Cidade de Deus, City of God, was very successful. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah was no, it? Even in England? Yeah, yeah, very, very successful. Most successful non-English language film in my lifetime. So it was it made so much money, but the... The actors in it got nothing out of it, really. It's only Sergio George that's famous now out of them. And they got treated very badly. It's not good at all. They should have all been millionaires, really. But the, the, the bosses of it took all money for themselves, didn't they? I'd seen it in a documentary. That, was, that really wasn't fair. But that film, the few French films we see in England, but we don't get a lot of foreign language films always. You always got there's the films we make in our own country which you obviously see, mm -hmm. Hollywood. And occasionally you get a film from France, and that's one from Brazil, and that was very famous. So you talk to somebody who's really interested in films in England, and you say you're Brazilian, they will talk to you about City of God because that's the reference of Brazilian culture is this film that was very, very popular. So that's the first Brazilian film I'd seen. I've seen a lot of them in Brazil, but well, that is DVD of that because my mum and my brother like the film. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's very, very popular abroad. And I don't think people quite realise how successful it was in Brazil. You don't always see, you 
I don't see the rest of the world's reaction always. But, that, that's why I was so surprised when you told me, like, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, very, very successful. He's very good artistic uh, cinema. So it's one of those kind of films that's there. I actually think I've seen better films than that, better oh, Brazilian films. No question about But that's, oh. the one that I should, that's one of them I should get abroad. So that's, that's a lot of people's reference of Portuguese language. That's a lot of the exposure. And it's not very easy to follow because it's not standard Portuguese. It's very local slang based. Yeah, and th this is actually my next question to you. Um, when it comes to speaking a Portuguese, of course, in the first moment, uh, you probably realized that the slangs here play m much more than you probably thought when you were actually learning. Just like in English, yeah. like uh, in the real life, sometimes or most of the times we'll see a totally different thing than we saw in the books. So how was yeah. that for you with the Portuguese? I didn't do, I did a bit of book-based studying, but not a huge amount. So what I, I consider normal Portuguese is a, a Baiano Portuguese or Bayanese, as a lot of people will say, or everyone says. So that's my reference of Portuguese is generally what's in people's sit, the way people talk in Bahia. I, I uh, have, uh, which state are you from? I'm from Rio Grande do Sul, very south of yeah, Brazil. I've, uh, I've been to Rio Grande do Sul. You've been here? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Porto Alegre first, and then we went to, uh, uh, what's it, Bento Gonçalves. We were there briefly, and Gramado. Very popular. Yeah. Yeah, Gramado is extremely Christmassy. Uh, we were there in the middle of January. <laughs> it's extremely Christmassy. So whereabouts are you then? Uh, Porto Alegre or the countryside? Uh, it's just between uh, Porto Alegre and Gramado. Okay. It's a city called Novo Hamburgo. Novo Hamburgo? Yeah. I went through there. <laughs> I'd seen that. Yeah. So, yeah, that's... That's, that's a place a lot of people will go past and probably not stay there very often. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, that's, yeah. that's okay. It's quite a convenient place to be. You can get to Porto Alegre easy. Uh, There's probably good work opportunities in Gramado with the tourism, I'd imagine. Work opportunities, I, I, can, I can tell that, especially when it comes like to our profession, which is like teaching English, but for some other types of Kind of work, but I'm not really sure because I'm not very familiar of the with the market in, in Gramado. But I know it's a little different, you know? Yeah, it's a very, very unique place. Unique place. Someone commented here, uh, Nirvana.itri uh, said yeah, that a tradução in Portuguese de filmes são muito boas, mas minha língua materna é o espanhol. Ah, então, ah. so Nirvana, you're not Brazilian, you are Spanish, but you live here? If you're still here, please let us know. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the, I do notice some films have very different names. Um, the, for example, Tropa de Elite is a film I really like. Very, very good film. And that's yeah. Elite Squad in English. So that's literal translation. City of God from Cidade de Deus. A lot. They're, they're ones I know have English names. I think Wagner Moore is quite famous abroad now, so... I think, because he was, uh, I'm not saying that, is it Narcos, that, where he's Don Pablo Escobar in it? Uh, the, it's in all the memes. I need to watch that sometime, because yeah. generally his stuff's good. <laughs> so yeah. I'd imagine that's also good, probably. Um, but yeah, when you translate the English language films, some are literal translations, but you get Poderoso Chefau from The Godfather. Mm -hmm. uh, Goodfellas, I think I've heard, is it Genshi Boa or something like that? That's, I think that's a bit more literal. I might, might be wrong. Goodfellas. That would be a good translation, but I'm not really familiar with that film, so I can tell. Uh, if, you like, if you like gangster films, you'll like it, generally. It's one of the best. Um, try to think what else. Uh, there's, there's a lot of films where it's weird, like Poderoso Chef o, It's not. That's completely different, well away from The Godfather, because it wouldn't be Padrino. No, it won't sound very gangstery, would it? Yeah. But <laughs> I imagine, I imagine that was the reasoning. Because there are some that are really quite different. Some of them are literal. Some are very different. I'm like, oh, that's 
it was a very subtle name, The Godfather, for the film, and then it's not subtle anymore. Now you said he's the powerful mafia boss that you was. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, Nirvana commented again. Uh, by the way, if you can uh, also tell us your name, uh, I'm not sure if that's Nirvana really or no. But uh, you live in in my state. Você é vizinho. Onde você mora aqui no Rio Grande do Sul? Venezuelana estuda e o pelo que entendi, uh, inglês britânico é mais difícil para ela. Uh, Gareth, I have I have actually to tell you that um, most of my my students and the students I've been able to speak with they actually have a lot of difficulty when it comes to the British English. And actually, there is a big difference, right? As, it's not as big as people think it is. One of the reasons is you have less of our films in your cinema. So you hear more American accents than British accents. Yeah. Um, you might be aware, people in Minas Gerais have a very, very strong accent, the Mineros. I was in Bahia two years when I visited Minas. First two days, they could have been speaking Japanese to me. I didn't understand the word. After that, my ears adjusted and it was okay. I think people lack the exposure to British accents. And one of the other things, there isn't one British accent. You you talk to a person, so I'm from Leeds. The state, the, we don't have states, they're called counties. So that's Yorkshire. You might have heard of the little dog, you pronounce it Yorkshire, the little dog. Mm. So that's from my region of England, the Yorkshire Terrier, we say. Mm -hmm. the terriers is a group of small dogs, and there's one from our region. And that's why people see that, and they say, oh, you're from a place called Yorkshire. Oh, that's like the little dog, for people think. <laughs> so, yeah, that is one of the things from my bit of England, that little dog originated there. So if you look in the map, you don't see, a, like, a, a state. You see a dog in the map. Yeah. <laughs> Our symbol is a white rose, the flower, but I think the dog is actually one of our main symbols. And you know, ferret, you call it pharrell, that's a, an animal that's really associated with my county. It's like the stereotype is there's a whippet, which is a really thin dog that does dog racing. So people have a flat cap, it's a type of hat, you'll see it on Peaky Blinders, so it's not just my bit of England. But that style of hat, it's almost a flat cap, so they say flat cap some whippets or ferrets when they're stereotyped in my counting. I've never owned a ferret. I've owned a flat cap once, never had a whippet. I usually had cats. I still have cats and uh, they're leaving me in peace at the moment for a change. <laughs> usually when I'm busy they want to be involved but uh, there is this stereotype of these animals in my region. The actual dog named after us isn't a part of a stereotype which is quite strange. Mm. So people always say The, the dog has the name of our county, but people within our country would stereotype whippets, the racing dogs, or ferrets. I would like a ferret. They are quite cute animals, but um, I think they'd be a bit difficult. I think they'd chew you wires and things, so you need to be careful with any kind of rodent if you let them free in your house. But I think they're quite nice animals. I have two dogs and a cat, but I don't usually bring them when I'm like going live because uh, sometimes I, they just I, want to start playing and messing around. So yeah, I I've got one of my cats. If I shut the door, the door is shut now. She meows very loudly. You'd hear her if she wants to come in. So I have to let her in if she wants to come in. She's too noisy otherwise. Sounds like a crying baby. It's a very noisy cat, but she don't want to be let in now. So it's okay. Have the peace to talk and not worry about her at the moment, but I have three cats, so uh, that's uh, my animal preference. I don't think a ferret would mix with cats, but I wouldn't mind having one. I think we so, could ask the crowd here, uh, guys, uh, pessoal, quem aí tem bichinho em casa, conta aí. Quantos bichinhos vocês têm em casa? E... Yeah, what animals do you have? Pessoal, uh, o entendimento de vocês, tá? acho que tem muita gente do Brasil aqui, Uh, se vocês estão yeah. tendo é, desafios né, para entender, vamos falar um pouquinho em português, vamos testar um pouquinho o inglês do, do Gareth, aliás, o português do Gareth. Vamos ver se o Não Gareth sabe falar mesmo. Alguém tem quatro, Nathan, quatro bichinhos, cachorros, gatos, porões. Papagaio? Okay. Nathan, Não tem papagaio aí, Nathan? <risos> Nathan, eu acho que fala, né? Não é Nathan. 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 Uh, 
Equivalent to Nathan in English. That's a quasi synonym. Yep. Okay. And uh, well, now I'm, I'm going to introduce myself a little. Vou me apresentar em português, né, na minha língua okay. materna do estado que eu estou aqui. É, primeiro, eu quero dizer que é um prazer estar te conhecendo, né, Gareth? É, Para quem yeah. talvez não saiba do contexto, uh, eu e Gareth, uh, nós começamos a nos falar há alguns dias aí yeah. é, pelo Instagram. Foi meio uh, aleatório até, né, na verdade, yeah. mas foi muito bacana porque a gente falou, vamos trocar uma ideia e tal, vamos, vamos fazer uma live, já surgiu a ideia de fazer uma live, bora, bora, vamos fazer. E aqui estamos, a gente está literalmente, é, eu e o Garrett se conhecendo e o pessoal conhecendo a gente também, né? Muita gente do Brasil, não sei se tem alguém de fora aí acessando. Quatro gatos, Nathan. Quatro gatos, four cats, Nathan. Nice. Four cats. I'm an amateur, I need more cats. <laughs> A Nirvana respondeu aqui, ó. Nirvana só não confirmou seu nome, se é Nirvana mesmo. Eu quero saber, fiquei curioso agora. Ué, você gosta da banda Nirvana, mas seu nome é outro. Você conta aí. Ela prefere português. V vamos tentar prosseguir então. Carry on in português. Cynthia Nunes é. dos. Não tenho animais de estimação. Pô, Cynthia, que pena. Garanto que vale a pena, hein? E é o tipo de coisa, depois que você tem um provavelmente vai querer ter mais, tá? Então, esse é o um spoiler que a gente pode te dar aí. Chega como um colecional grande. Você não consegue, porque você, você pega um animal de estimação. Depois, <risos> a Nirvana é o nome dela mesmo, cara. Que incrível. Cara, a primeira pessoa que eu conheço com esse nome. Parabéns, viu? Muito bom. Eu vi um, um trocado de jogadores, tem um foto de... Uh, futebol brasileiro, John Lennon e Michael Jackson, dois jogadores brasileiros. <risos> eu não conhecia o Michael Jackson, John Lennon eu conhecia. <risos> Acho que é. eles podem já fazer uma banda, né? Além de jogar futebol. Bea, sou um gato, you need more. Você precisa mais. Você precisa mais, <risos> mais Bea. É, e você precisa adotar mais um gato e treinar ele para ser um gato bilíngue, ainda por cima. Para responder em inglês também. Miel e miel. Essa é a Sam. Todos os gatos são bilíngues, né? Porque em inglês eles falam miau e em português é parecido também. É miau, né? Muda pouca coisa ali. Uh, the verb to miau and the noun is a miau. So, you have miado. It's always miau in English. That's the only oh, word. Oh, that's right. The... That's right. Yeah. In Portuguese, uh, we say to, the, to separate things. Yeah. Like miau, the yeah. sound... And the, um, the, the noun. Yeah. yeah, but with the dog, you've got lata and bark. And you say ow, which is a hurt yourself noise in English. And it's woof, which doesn't sound that much like a dog, to be fair. I think ow, if done correctly, sounds like a dog a bit more. But ow is already something else. So it doesn't work. <laughs> no, th that's actually, um, how can I say... Uh, not complex. And I lack the word now. Meow as well in Spanish. This they have meow the same way as it is in Portuguese and Japanese. Well, that's a noise a cat makes. I don't see how you can have anything else. The yeah. French say minu, so but that's different. French cat said minu, but I, that's a little bit. I never fun. saw yeah. a French cat to tell so. No, uh, me neither. Just cats in England, a very common pet there. Here, it's more, I think, dogs. You see more dogs in because less people. Yeah, I think so. I think because in England, more people live in houses, have very few apartments. London is more apartments than houses. But the rest of the country, you'd have a neighborhood that has maybe two apartment buildings, two blocks of flats, we say in England. Maybe two in a neighborhood. And then the rest is houses. So I would say more than 90% of British people live in houses. So people have house cats, they go outside. Apartment cats stay in the apartment. So I don't think you see all the cats in Brazil. So I think a lot uh, of them are... Uh, I believe Brazil, uh, já, trocando para o português para facilitar um pouco para o pessoal aí, para vocês conseguirem entender um pouco de tudo. Uh, eu acredito que as pessoas que têm gatos aqui no Brasil, geralmente são uh, house 
cats, right? Mm-hmm. Not yeah. uh, apartment, apartment cats. Eu apartment me confundi. Cats, yeah. Because they don't leave, <laughs> eles não saem. É, poucas yep. pessoas aqui do Brasil deixam seus gatos saírem de casa. Por exemplo, o meu apartamento aqui, se eu te mostrar a minha janela agora, deixa okay. eu ver se eu consigo. Uh, ah, yeah. O pedestal está na pedestal, está em frente. You can see this. Uh, it's a, in português, it's tela, but in English, it's a net. network? Net. No? Net. net. Yeah, it's a net. Yeah. net. So, we don't usually allow the cats to go out. Nós não permitimos que os gatos saiam pela preocupação, porque eles podem se meter em brigas, é. podem é. ser atropelados, uma série de coisas, porque as cidades aqui são bastante movimentadas. É. And it's an apartment, the cat finding its way back isn't as easy as it is with a house. The cats know their house and the street near it and there are other roofs and whatever going everywhere, but they know the area. It's a big apartment block. It's difficult. And people who live in the apartment block maybe don't want other people's cats entering and stealing their fish. <laughs> This is kind of thing to happen. <laughs> Nirvana disse, os gatos são donos deles mesmos, né? So, the cats own themselves. Would yeah. that be something like that in English? Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things my grandparents always used to say was, you don't own the cat, the cat owns you. Because my grandparents, they, they, they didn't actually adopt that many cats. They always had cats. But most of them were just cats that decided they lived in my grandma's house. They lived somewhere else first and realized, oh, there's a nice old lady that sits on the sofa all afternoon. I sit here. Oh, I get a saucer of milk when I come to this old lady's house. She opens a tin of tuna and gives it to me when I come here. And this there... Uh, People can't do this. You can't just decide, I like the food she has in her house. I live here now. Cats, they do that. Definitely. Apartment cats, yeah. no, but house cats. There was like five different cats decided to live in my grandma's house. People can't do that. Cats just do that. Uh, my wife, before the cats came, said, no cats on the bed. The cats sleep on the bed more than we do. They're probably there now. <laughs> I think that uh, the real thing is the the cats own the beds, but they borrow us the bed at night. So <laughs> yeah, we we do lend the bed from them at night. It is, yeah, it's like that. You have to sort of twist yourself between cats and oh. not disturb them. It yeah. happens. Yeah. Nathan comentou: os gatos aqui de casa saem de casa, porém eles não sabem pular e ficam miando. Em inglês, ou seja, é. os gatos do Nathan Fowler. Para Você até yeah, comentou, they... né, Gareth, sobre o fato de em inglês ser woof, enquanto yeah. em português é all. E faz sentido, mas se você pensar, eu acho que woof me lembra um cachorro grande. Sabe aqueles cachorros grandes? Yeah. The big dogs. Woof, woof. Yeah. But the small dog like is like dogs. Yeah. yeah. Woof is a big dog noise. They're a bit deeper sound, and owls are a bit higher pitched. So like one of these little Yorkshire Terriers, they would make an owl sound. And a German Shepherd, you'd, uh, that kind of dog, you'd get a fuller woof sound. So yeah, I think it maybe is uh, different. I think in Brazil, there's possibly more small dogs because of apartments. If you've got a little apartment, you're not going to have a golden retriever or an alsatian or a, a german shepherd you might have a yorkshire terrier or a shih tzu or a bulldog bulldogs are quite small so there's a bit more space you have a very big dog you don't have space for a very big dog in a very small apartment and i am a living example of that if i show you my dogs now actually my animals one is sleeping here at the door because he usually likes to wait for me when i yeah. finish him Say hi. Yeah. Hello, guys. And there's the <laughs> other. She's enjoying the room. Yeah. Both are Shih Tzus and the cat is, of course, sleeping. Yeah. Lucy, yeah. say hi. <laughs> you, know, you know, the funny thing about my cat, uh, she was raised with the two dogs. A minha, yeah. minha gata foi criada com os dois cachorros. Às vezes eu esqueço de voltar para o português para facilitar para o pessoal. 
A minha gata foi criada com os dois cachorros que eu já, eu já tinha eles quando ela chegou. E parece que o, o gato, ele começa a pegar as manias de cachorro. Ele começa a se comportar muitas vezes parecido com um cachorro. Eu não acreditava nisso antes. Mas hoje, por exemplo, a minha gata, se eu chamo, ela vem. Ela é bastante yeah. apegada. She's still attached to me. Yeah. You know, she yeah. wants to physically be around, uh, which normally cats usually don't do. Like normal cats, they just do their own I thing. I think you know? there's a lot of... A lot of cats will, the cat will be dominating the dogs, so the cat will want to be in control. So the cat likes making the dogs feel jealous. And the dogs will get jealous when the cat comes near you. And that, will, that is why the cat does it. The cat maybe wants attention, but wants to upset the dogs more than anything else. So I think that is what, what happens. Eu nunca olhei por esse lado, mas você tem razão. Porque quando a minha gata vem pedir carinho, o cachorro vem atrás, né? E, pô, como assim? Faz carinho em mim também, daí quando vê, tá todos os bichos ali na volta. My mother-in-law has a dog, and the dog was there, and there was uh, my wife's cousin's cat going past. Wanted to call the cat to stroke the cat. A uh, dog straight in the way, that lick in my hand, not allowing it. They, they do that, dogs. They're very jealous and possessive possessive of people. Cats, if you want to go get the cat to uh, stay with you, the cat will just ignore you. When you ignore the cat, something else, the cat will be in the way. When I have work to do on my computer, a class, uh, class planning, translation, there's always a cat sat on my mouse pad. There's always a cat walking all over the place. I've managed to do this live cat free. I'm quite surprised at that. But probably at some point in this conversation, you might hear me owing. That will happen probably. Uh, maybe they're asleep and I'm not noticed there's a closed door here. That's one of my cats that hates closed doors. <laughs> cat closed But doors. But when we talk about cats. like uh, the moments you kind of ignore the cats, uh, in Portuguese, a gente... Não, não sei se a gente usaria a mesma palavra ignorar, porque a gente não faz necessariamente de propósito. It's not on purpose that we ignore the cats. We're just doing our own, our own thing. Like, a gente está fazendo nossas coisas. Quando não damos atenção para o gato, poderíamos falar dessa forma em português, they stay on the way, like you said. Yeah. And that's so true. Like, my cat, a minha gata, quando eu estou fazendo as minhas coisas e não estou dando bola para ela, uh, it looks like she... She anticipates where I'm going to sit, for example. So yeah. if she knows I'm going to the sofa, she will go there and just lay on the sofa. Ela vai deitar no sofá exatamente no meu lugar para chamar yeah. minha atenção. Or in my chair here, in my office. She will go in front of me. Ela vai na frente. And she will sit in my office chair because she knows I'm going to come. Yeah. Uh, my cat likes to sell my office chair sometimes. Yeah. Uh, it's like, I need to do work. You get out of my chair. Dining chairs as well. Be lunch, can be lunchtime, and there's four dining chairs there. And there's three cats, so sometimes there's only one free dining chair when we want to go get lunch. <laughs> so It's funny because in the dining chairs, like usually the dogs like them more. So usually my dogs will be in the dining chairs because probably they want to have dinner with me, but I never let them. Probably, yeah. <laughs> the, the, I think that's usually what it is. Yeah, but yeah, uh, pets are really good friends, and I think everyone should have pets. Uh, Jared, uh, deixa eu te perguntar em português. Uh, agora vamos falar sobre as dúvidas mais comuns, né, dos nossos alunos, né, das pessoas que estão aprendendo em inglês. E eu acho que seria muito bacana a gente conseguir ter, uh, que nem o James que comentou agora aqui, James Green Pictures. Uh, estou aprendendo português brasileiro. Oh, so you are not Brazilian, Também. James. Uh, ok, where are you from? Uh, uh, pessoal, que vocês forem tendo de dúvidas, vão deixando no chat aqui. A gente vai começar a responder algumas dúvidas de vocês agora. Não só aqui do chat, mas também dúvidas de alunos em geral. Qual é uma das principais dificuldades, Gareth, uh, que você percebe uh, em um brasileiro tentando aprender inglês? Uh, you may have seen... The, there's a reel I've posted today, and that's 
history and story. That's, that's quite fresh in my head because I posted that today as a short on my YouTube channel. So I made this post today. There is one word in Portuguese, historia. So use historia <laughs> for story and history. People generally will say history and never use the word story, when in fact, story is more often correct than history. History is a study of the past. Mm -hmm. So like the subject at school, you're a historian, history. You're studying the past. So you like if you get... want to say, this is, uh, you, you should say instead, like this is my story, like as a new yeah. story. But uh, yeah, you, could, you can sort of word it and use, this is my history. You'd say your work history, that's the past. But as a general narrative, you'd use the word story. So you don't say the history of a film, you'd say the st story of the film, because it's the narrative. The, you could say this book's a good story, the film has a good storyline, it's something you might hear as well. So people not using the word story at all, when it's usually more likely to be correct than history. History is usually only used for academic studies of the past. Mm -hmm. If you say somebody's history, you're saying they're in the past and they're finished. So you could say, oh, yeah, that's, that's history now. That's ancient history now. That's finished. That was a long time in the past. But when you're actually talking about the narrative, it's a story. I, I so, would say that it was quite mind-blowing now. But let me see if I get it straight. Uh, vamos ver se eu entendi até para o pessoal que está acompanhando aí. Então, você está dizendo que history é algo do passado que já houve um encerramento. Acabou. Ficou sim. no passado. Sim. Isso é história agora. Está lá no passado. E story, story é algo que ainda está tendo uma continuidade. É isso? Pode ser isso. É, é um narrativo. Então, é um narrativo geralmente. Não é tempo específico. Então, não tem uma especificação de tempo, de horário, de data. Could be any time story. It's just a narrative that what happened. So history, you have to talk about in simple past or past perfect. It has to be, cannot be continuous now. So if it's still happening, you wouldn't use the word history as such. So if you think about the school subject of history, think about how that is. If the thing you're not talking about couldn't be in a history class at school, you maybe shouldn't be using the word history. And that's because okay. there's not two words. There's, for example, it does work the other way. The word play in English can be three different words in Portuguese. De brinca, joga, toca. So you play music, you play with your friends in the street, and you play football. But you'd joga football, you would toca musica, you would brinca com amigos. So there, that's, that's what sometimes happens. It happens both ways. Uh, sometimes you have more than one word for one word in another language. So it happens a few ways. Sometimes you don't remember everything like that. Um, basic mistake, people giving an age, I've heard... I've been in an interview at an English school and somebody said, I just, I want to be an English teacher, but I just have 21 years. I'm like, you're not getting picked to be an English teacher if you can't give your age correctly in English. So people thinking you use the verb to have for age in Portuguese, it's a verb to be in English. And that confuses a lot of people at the start. So that's one of the first ones to happen. And some people, People are more advanced forget this as well. It's a very basic one. You you, you hear this a lot? Yeah, not not really that one. Uh, mas eu posso dizer, eu vou, eu vou às vezes insistir em trocar para português para que o pessoal não fique muito perdido. Eu sei que mais gente entrou, Cauã Nascimento, F Santo, Gabriel, Lucas, Carlos Medina, meu amigo, Pô, Carlos, e aí? Uh, Costa Rubia do Carmo, Rubia do Carmo, imagino, né? Então, bem-vindo a vocês aí. O que eu vejo muito, e pessoal, se vocês se identificam 
comentem aqui, é verdade. Se vocês têm alguma dúvida, alguma dificuldade comum para vocês, coloquem aqui também. Mas eu vejo muitos alunos e pessoas que estão querendo aprender ter dificuldade em conjugação de verbos. Às vezes eles usam verbos uh, no presente, mas eles conjugam no passado. Uhum. Ou eles querem falar do passado. They want to talk about the past, but they use a, in, in the present form. And they are so confused, like, with what is a simple past, you know, uh, the, the, ver the variations, you know, of the time tenses. This is really a big deal for, I would say, I would dare to say that most Brazilians have this challenge in learning English. Yeah, I think that happens both ways. I think you have more conjugation in Portuguese. Some people think it will be easier because there's less in English, but there is still a conjugation pattern and it's not necessarily as regular as it is in Portuguese because there's a pattern usually. The pattern isn't as obvious in English. There are regular verbs and it, the person's rather in each individual pronoun being different quite often. So I th think sometimes it's, people not listening enough and hearing things in the right context. I think many courses are very focused on, let's just teach the grammar, let's show, teach people how to form each tense. And there's a lot of time spent on how to form tenses. Very little attention to how to use. Mm -hmm. It's how to use that's more important, really, because if you can form a tense perfectly, but you don't know when to use it, you've wasted your time, haven't you? <laughs> So yeah. I think I think the confusion isn't people forming tenses wrong, it's using the wrong tense. And that's because the lessons haven't been structured correctly. So when I put together an English class, I would think I'd select, ah, this is simple present. When do you use simple present? Daily routines is a good example of one of the things, or facts. Daily routines. I have to select, what vocabulary do I need for daily routines? And then you structure your class around these kind of things. You want to talk about memories. You want simple past, for example. Think of a vocabulary subject that fits it and there's a context. And you can make a real conversation that makes sense using a vocabulary that fits a situation that fits the tense. Class Classes aren't usually put together this way at a lot of language schools. And that's why people spend seven years doing a course and they still can't speak properly because there's not been context for everything. There's been a lot of reading and writing. More reading will make you write better. You could write very good English. If you don't have the confidence of conversation, it's completely different. It's not listening enough. Because if you need to read it, you can't understand from listening. You didn't practice listening enough. There, there, I, I always say that there are different, different ways to learn English. Uh, you can learn in a passive or in an active way. Uh, para os meus alunos, eu sempre digo, você vai aprender de formas passivas ou ativas. Passive yep. ways to learn, passivas, uh, it's when you hear uh podcast or yeah. when you were just watching this live this is a passive way of learning right when you yeah. read a book or when you just uh watch a movie or a series and you are reading the captions and some somewhat trying to make sense of it this is a passive way active way is basically what lacks in most of the people that are trying to speak english and this is basically the big picture of the course as you told me muitas pessoas uh fazem cursos por três, cinco anos, às vezes mais, você falou sete anos, seven years, seven mm -hmm. years. Yeah, And they time. can't speak properly. Like, why this happens? Because they lack the active way of learning. And what is the active way? The people seem to act like there was just a passive way. Oh, I watch series in English. And I changed my phone settings to be just in English in my computer. You know, I read in English, and I have a lot of English income, input. But the input is the passive way. What is the active way? Is when you, no, express it. When yeah. you 
formulate tenses, uh, tenses uh, sentences when you actually dare to speak and to practice actively. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think sometimes it's even people don't listen enough. People just read. Reading, of course, is good, but the the you need to do the passive things, and the passive things you can do by yourself. But I think many people don't actively try talk or actively try write something. Sometimes, um, this this is the thing. I think another thing that happens is people will have their classes. I don't know the course. To have two hours a week with a teacher spread out, and they don't bother doing it. Anything between, if you made a real effort to watch something on Netflix every day, listen to podcasts regularly, plus the classes, and in classes you force yourself to be involved with the conversations happening, and then you have a difference. And if you, it's the amount of effort you put between classes that makes more difference than the classes. Many people like to oh, just kick my stand there. Many people like to blame the methodology, the teacher. Did you do your homework? Did you turn up on time to your classes? Did you pay attention? Were you proactive? And the answer, truthfully, is probably no one. All of these, when they complain about a course, it's always that. It's always somebody else's fault. People didn't do what they needed to do to improve the English and they point the finger. I had the same experiences as a personal trainer. I'm fat because of my gym, because of my personal trainer. No, you're fat because you sit on the sofa eating cochina every night when you get in from work. That's why you're fat. Don't blame the personal trainer or the gym. Blame your own lack of discipline between your visits to the gym. As when you've had any job that has anything to do with teaching other people people like to blame somebody else people don't like to admit ah, I was too lazy I didn't put enough effort in it's always ah, that school's rubbish that teacher's not good you didn't do your homework it's like a school, kids at school ah, the school's rubbish, my teachers are rubbish, you do your homework no, do you do you listen to the teacher anyway? No. It's it's one of the difficulties that teachers will have. The student needs to do their part. Yeah, this is so true. So true. And uh, I will even say that in Portuguese, uh, para as pessoas que estão agora aqui, as que vão assistir a gravação depois, uh, não quero que haja nenhum equívoco Nenhum misunderstanding, nenhum engano aqui. Vocês têm que entender isso. Quem entender isso vai conseguir ter muito mais poder sobre o seu, a, su, a sua história de, de construir um aprendizado de verdade, tá? O importante não é o que você faz na aula. É o que você faz entre as aulas. Foi o que o professor falou. Gareth said, The most important is not what you do in the class, but in between, entre... Ou seja, yeah. fez o tema de casa, você praticou, você ouviu bastante o exercício, o listening, podcast, uh, filmes, sem legenda de preferência, inclusive existe uma metodologia que eu uso na minha mentoria, eu vou dar o um spoiler dela aqui, é, eu gastaria mais de uma live falando só sobre isso, mas envolve você pegar não um episódio inteiro de uma série, nem um filme inteiro, mas você pega um pedacinho e esse pedacinho vai variar de tamanho, de acordo com o seu nível, e você vai assistir esse mesmo pedacinho com o áudio em inglês, obviamente, mas uma legenda em português. Você repete esse pedacinho com o áudio em inglês e a legenda em inglês, e depois você repete esse mesmo pedacinho só com áudio, sem legenda nenhuma. Você, através da repetição, começa a treinar o seu cérebro para conseguir entender e deixar de depender de ter legenda o tempo todo. Certo? Yeah, uh... Então... O importante é você made fazer em similar recommendations. I've made this is if you rewatch something you've used in the past, if you've watched a film and you've had Portuguese subtitles, try rewatch it with the English. It can be little pieces or it can be the full thing. I think the familiarity with what you watch makes a big difference. One thing that's yeah. taught 
taught me a lot of Portuguese is watching football on TV in Brazil mm-hmm. because I always watched football in England. I already understood how the sport works. So I can see what's happening. Translation generally is very bad for language learning. So I see uh, what's happening with the football. I can see, ah, oh, this is a, a corner. I hear the word escan. And you watch twice a week. You watch one team or two teams. Could be two games a week, four games a week. Watch even more if you want it. And you hear the words of what's happening. So you associate the words you hear with the action. So I could have got a list. Corner, escanteo, tira de meta, goal kick, falta, foul, cata, morello, yellow card etc. You write this down in a list. I'll, would that be in my brain properly? I would be translating it and it would take me longer in my brain to say the right thing. But because within a couple of years I could easily talk about football to a Brazilian person who speaks no English because the input you get, the passive input of it's 90 minutes if you don't listen to the pre go the pre-game the halftime analysis, uh, short intervalo, it says here, or the post match, post yoga. You have all these bits. That can be two and a half hours, everything maybe, depending on the way it's broadcast. And that's pure listening with context, and you can see the actions. So I don't translate with vocabulary. I have a picture, English word, picture, English word. But the next week I take away the English word and see if you remember. I want people to associate the English word with the picture, not with the Portuguese word. Perfect. And that's, that's kind of what happened. And it wouldn't be enough to just watch the football. You need to go to the bar and talk about the football with people, with your friends that like football. So that's the thing. You pick something you're interested in. Uh, MasterChef's one I watch. I, I always liked cooking. And my wife and I watch Master Chef when it's on, and I already knew what all the processes were. Generally, you get some weird ingredients that only exist in certain regions of Brazil I've never seen before, of course. But there's generic stuff that exists in the whole world, and you do hear things. You hear the processes. You hear the feedback, and it makes more sense. And you do cook some times with other people when you're in places. So if you have an interest in something, you could always find a TV program to match your interest. And then you can try find people who speak your target language with the same interest. And then you have the ready conversation. I find between English people and Brazilians, football works and works across. People from the USA, football to them is American football, not real football. So... Maybe a soccer, as they'll call it, there's low down on the list. They've got basketball, they've got uh, gridiron, the American football, they've got ice hockey, uh, they've got baseball there. But for English, or British English uh, language, you have the, the easiest way for a lot of people to find a common ground is football. Do you like football for yourself? Or... I am more into music, to be honest. I am a yeah. musician, so besides... Music does work, too. Uh, you're a musician, too? No, I said music. People do manage to bond over music quite a lot because a lot of people are into, especially people who are into rock music. You say you're from England, straight away people are talking about the Beatles, Led Zeppelin, Rolling Stones, Pink Floyd. Uh, the list continues. Uh, more modern, Oasis, even though not together, people can still remember them. You can, you can probably remember Oasis being together. You can't remember <laughs> the Beatles. You're too young to remember them all being alive. And uh, Arctic Monkeys, I think, are our big band now. They're, they're famous here. So there is this. Uh, we don't realise within our own country how popular our old rock bands are abroad. You don't think about it, you just think, oh, the people in Brazil listen to 
the Beatles and Pink Floyd. You wouldn't think that would happen until you get here, and then you realise, ah, huh, more people like the Beatles and Pink Floyd in Brazil than do in England at the moment. Because that, it's the, the older music there. There's been newer music that's more mainstream among younger people. And very few people in Britain won't know who the Beatles are. And that's, come on, you've got to know who they are. <laughs> There's one of them still going. Too old? Uh, or, or why is that? Like the, the people in Brazil I, are more sometimes with that. I think it's the radio. Sometimes you hear older music from Britain in the radio in Brazil. I think the more up-to-date stuff maybe doesn't get in as often. I think the international music that's more modern, that's popular in Brazil, is not as good as the older stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the thing. Um, you could even say, as a general rule of thumb, older Brazilian mu music is better than newer Brazilian music. I don't know. What, what sort of music do you usually play? And uh, Like uh, 80% of my set list is international music, like yeah. American or uh, Beatles and the classic bands. People in Brazil are really into international music. At, at least the yeah. people from the genre, which is uh, basically rock. Yeah, you know? yeah, rock is quite big. Uh, have you been to rock? I went to the last Rock in Rio. I was quite a lot of people there. So it's, it's a big, big event. I don't know how many people there were not Brazilian. I don't know how many people. The bands, a lot of them weren't. I think the... the, the no, if I saw, I think there's only Capital and Isiel who were Brazilian there. I'm sorry. I think it was just Capital and Isiel, the only Brazilian rock band there at Rock and Rio when I went. The rest were yes, international. It's in Brazil, Capital and Isiel. Yeah, uh, very good set they are. I think they're very good. Um, but then I do, out of all rock music, I have more preference towards punk, post-punk, then indies, another sub subgenre of punk. So punk and its subgenres are probably my preference more with rock music. Like uh, it, it's very abstract if you think like punk or even uh, indie rock. Like to me, indie rock, uh, it's not a uh, subgenre. It, it's like a whole genre. It's, yeah, it does seem that way. It, it is a subgenre of punk and post-punk fundamentally. So. The, the whole sort of ethos of indie music was about being independent of record labels. So the, the reason it exists were you have a band, people who are really into indie music, myself included, but I'm not as, as tribal as some are, would use the word mainstream as a criticism. A lot of mainstream music is rubbish, but... I think the criticism should be based on the quality, not the fact something's mainstream, like it's popular, it's successful. You, if you want to think of what anti-indie is, it'd be like the Beatles or Coldplay. Even Oasis, to an extent, even a lot of people label them as indie, they weren't indie, they were just a normal rock band. They, they did have creative control and power, but they weren't underground enough sufficiently to be considered indie. They were so mainstream, they were the biggest band in the world. By a long way, no indie band gets that big and still keeps its identity as indie. I get it and I agree with you, but uh, you see that uh, my point is all right, uh, it's a concept like talking yeah. about just indie or anti indie, it's a concept, but it's not a music genre, you know? That it I want kind to of know is, I am style of music this band plays. So, for example, uh, Arctic, Arctic Monk is, uh, I, I don't know if today is still considered as indie rock band, but in the past was. Yeah, a lot of people say indie or alternative rock, what people usually label them as. The last two al albums are a bit strange, and I don't think that would fit in the usual kind of indie subcategory. I think uh, they've, they've adjusted the sound a bit, but there was, there is punk influence, like there is in all indie if you hear them because punk was the first subgenre of rock to sort of go in this direction where it was about not being conventionally musical, musically mm -hmm. talented, 
there was a spirit of rebellion quite often. A lot of protest songs, so like the Clash are very much that kind of way. Sex Pistols too, back then before Johnny Rotten became a fascist. <laughs> and um, it was this kind of rebellious streak about uh, your singing voice doesn't matter that much. What is classically acclaimed kind of uh, classic musical talent? Why is, why is it like, you think the original era is when Queen were at their peak? So Queen was seen as anti-punk. So, because they would say Freddie Mercury is a very traditional kind of singer, and then you listen to the punk singers, and they're different. I said, why, why is he good, but he's not? And yeah, and the guitarist different, and things like that, and the style. But that's, they'd be considered more conventionally musically talented. But the, are they better than the punk bands? I don't think they're as influential. I think less bands have been influenced by them to do things than punk. Uh, then the punk came this way, then there was post-punk, so like the Jam, very good post-punk band. Capital Initial are being post-punk rather than indie. And it was Manchester, the city that indie came out of. So Speaking about a... when you talk about punk in Brazil, like I would say that the first band that comes into any Brazilian's mind is Ramones, even that's yep. not particularly on the source of the punk genre, but everybody in Brazil loves Ramones. Yeah, I don't think, uh, not met that many Ramones fans, but then the thing with Ramones, people, that, not only if someone's a Ramones fan or not, lots of people wear the t-shirt and wouldn't be able to name five of their songs. <laughs> you, you know, this is a fact. I, I like the Ramones. They probably were the first punk band, but the style of punk music was probably created by the Kinks or Led Zeppelin. So Communication Breakdown by Led Zeppelin, 1969, has the same style of guitar playing as most punk songs have after. They weren't a punk band, but uh, there's a handful of bands around the 60s that probably changed a lot of how rock sounds. So yeah, Ramones should be the first band you think of when you say punk because they created it as a movement, but the actual sound of them wasn't 100% original. You could hear examples of songs that are a little bit, a bit similar in style that are older. And of course, Led Zeppelin were a lot better musically than the Ramones. <laughs> and they even uh, did a lot of covers of old bands, right? So uh, maybe it kind of shows the influence that they had on older bands which in some way helps to make them not that original, as you said, for the style, but they're yeah. kind of... It was the fact they were... It was the fact they had a different kind of... A different kind of style to everybody else. They were something cool and new. But yeah, there's, there's covers, but the covers they made do sound like it's their own. It doesn't sound like the old one as such. And you said a very interesting word now. Uh, a few weeks back, one of my students uh, asked me this. Marlon, uh, trying to understand, uh, why do you use the word cool? Cool doesn't mean uh, frio, gelado? It can do, but it's a double meaning, hasn't it? So it's there's the legal kind of cool, and there's the Frio kind of cool. And it's context. Music doesn't have temperature, so it's obviously commenting on its sort of popularity or kind of thing. So a person but being the, cool, it would be popular. We, we could understand that, but the curiosity that he had, and I get it, is not, okay, I get it, but why? Who? on earth had this idea, okay, this word means gelado, frio. I'm going to use it for something nice as well. I don't know. Uh, it's because the difference between cold and cool is cool can be a more comfortable kind of cold. Just like you got hot and warm, warm can feel comfortable. And you can, you'd say, oh, the weather's warm, that's nice, it has a more positive connotation. So if you describe a person as being warm, it'll mean quite nice, outgoing, welcoming. So cool and warm when you describe a person 
um, quite, quite positive words anyway. So describe someone as cool, it'd be like, like it's been used to describe, it can mean calm, it can mean, oh, you're cool under pressure. So the word can have a few other positive connotations or a few other positive meanings. So it's not a negative word. Like if somebody's cold, that would be like they don't want contact with people. So like and, people and like, in London are quite cold. People in Germany are quite cold. They don't like the, the contact and the interaction. People in, especially northeast Brazil, you know, people are quite warm and want interaction and uh, uh, physical, more physical contact sometimes and things like this. So, so you got somebody being cold or somebody being warm. You would say like that. Cool can mean you kind of relaxed. It can mean kind of a popular way. It can mean you don't have a bad temper. You have a cold temper. Then you got hot. So hot can mean angry. It can mean badly tempered. It can mean somebody's attractive as well. But that's sort of a diff different meaning. But you can have these diff different levels because hot's more extreme. So it's a bit more comfortable to be warm or cool than to be hot or cold. So that's mm -hmm. kind of maybe some of the logic. People have used cool this way longer than I've been alive. So it's, um, it's something, it's not always easy to explain, but if you can see the different, different words for temperature, can cool and warm generally have a better connotation than hot or cold because it's more moderate. In, in Brazil, we also have this term, but in a very limited context, for example, uh, when you would say, stay cool, it means stay relaxed, stay chill. Yeah, that, does, that makes sense in English. If you say chill out, which is also a cold, a cool thing, chill. Chill can yeah, but, uh, for be very cold. In a challenging situation, when you are like trying to tell your friend, stay cool, you know, like this yeah, is a challenge, that, but stay cool. Very common in English, too. Yeah. In Portuguese, we say the same. We say fica frio. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Frio, cool. Fica frio. Th this is a, a connection between these uh, expressions. But I think uh, in my experience, it's there. Because we don't use frio in Brazil for other contexts. Like, ah, ele é frio. He's cool. No, in, in English, we can say that. No, this guy is cool. Okay, it's legal. No? It's legal. Bacana, one of these kind of words. Yeah, when you say someone's free, or you'd mean they're like cold, like unfriendly and very closed and not outgoing, maybe a bit introverted, quite often For, implied. In these same contexts, frio and frio is the same as cold. Even though yeah. in the sentence fica frio, it means the same as cool. So yeah. I would say have just one word when you guys have two. You have cool mm -hmm. or cold, but we just have frio. Fica frio. Ah, aquele cara é muito frio. Ele é frio. Yeah. Apache, sabe? There's, speaking of this, you quite often hear people saying people in England drink hot beer. And that's really weird because when you say that in English to an English person drinking hot beer, thinking do you put it in the mic do you think we put beer in the microwave before drinking it because beer is almost frozen in brazil usually so like the brazilians only know lager as a group of beers generally there's certain areas where uh, what you would call we call craft beer you say cerveja artisanal you have ales which is a far bigger group of beers most beers in england are ales that are actually ours lagers are usually usually imported. We've only got one lager from our country. That's not good anyway. About the beer now, uh, how popular is craft beer where you live right now? Because here, in my state... It's very it's popular very... in the south. South and southeast, craft beer is quite strong. The northeast, it's growing, it exists, but it's not as strong. But it's a bit more expensive. The weather here is hotter, which I think is why people like lighter colder beer like almost frozen like have a stick in it and have a ice lolly instead of drinking it liquidly it's almost like that almost happens the you got to remember that the type of beer we have in england's different there's a thing called a cellar you would call it a parau i think 
So that's in a house. The floor underground is quite cool. So it's maybe five or six degrees. So that's not warm. But you could store English style beer, the ale, there's bitter, there's stout, there's IPA. These beers taste better at about five or six degrees, not the temperature of lager. If you make an ale, be it a pale ale, a dark ale, a medium ale, which is a flatter, heavier beer. I know you say IPA, it's actually IPA, so that's an English style of beer. I don't really like these, I prefer darker ones. This style of beer, if you get it as cold as a lager, you can't taste it anymore. You've pretty much frozen the taste out of it. So it has a correct temperature to taste its best does every beer. If you let a, I don't know, a Bohemia get warm, it's horrible. If it's uh, put in the freezer for enough time before and it's properly ice cold, then it's good. And, so and that's correct temperature. kind of beers because they actually intend to... To, to freeze the taste, like uh, you, you, they want to hide the bad taste, like a Bohemia skin. Skull. Uh, skin's disgusting, that's horrible. <laughs> that's why they serve it ice cold, because if you put them on the uh, warmer temperature, not a hotter, but a warmer or a yeah, cooler it's temperature. It's not cold enough, it doesn't taste nice, yeah. Every, every drink has its perfect temperature. You drink coffee cold, it's horrible. Hot, it's good. So actually, I, look, I you, like cold brew. <laughs> uh, it doesn't taste the same, though, does it? It's different hot coffee to cold coffee. Actually, okay, it, it, it doesn't taste uh, really different, but the experience is so different that makes you yeah, think it's different. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's the thing with beer. And another thing is people drink whiskey in Brazil with ice, coconut water, that changes the taste of the whiskey. So oh, every, drink, every drink, when you change the temperature, it's different. Like, Europeans will think Brazilians are crazy for putting red wine in the fridge. For me, the wine belongs in the bin, I don't like it. Uh, you might disagree being a gaucho and you having your vineyards and your wineries there, but I think wine belongs in the bin, I don't like it at all, really. But It's supposed to be room temperature. So room temperature in Europe is considered to be 18 degrees. Room temperature in Bahia is going to be closer to 30, so I imagine that's too warm. <laughs> and the fridge is also too cold. So, And that's I the point, Gary. When, when you're talking like about wine in a room temperature, I agree with you. But uh, the universal room temperature for a red wine, it's not the same room temperature you would have in Bahia. So you yeah. have to put it in the air conditioning on to get it to 19 degrees, <laughs> wait till it's the correct and then leave it out. But yeah, that's expensive. I'll leave it in front of the fan just to make sure it's not too warm. That might not work either. I've never felt the urge to have a glass of wine in bite. I don't feel the urge ever to have a glass of wine, really, to be honest. But the, the temperature things taste best. That is a thing. And English style beers need to be sort of five or six degrees. So that's the fridge instead of the freezer, uh, which is the main difference. So, yeah, people think that, but you'd actually have to go to a pub in England and order a beer to actually see what it's like. It's not like leaving, putting a can of lager in the microwave, like it almost sounds like when people say hot beer. Like uh, we put it in the pan, boil it up. <laughs> it's, the, it's the lack of vocabulary, like when Brazilians yeah. say... Uh, just, just use the same example. Here we will use just one word, frio, but yeah. in English it's cool or cold. And yeah. here we use just hot, but for you okay. it can mean warm, it can mean hot. Hot. Lukewarm, which means even less warm, but a bit warm. <laughs> it's, just, it's kind of like when you've left your hot coffee a little bit too long before drinking it. And yeah, that's the thing. We'd say our beer should be cool, so that's a bit, a bit cold, but the lag there should be cold, which is more cold. It, no, that's right. And also, England's a lot colder the weather, so your beer doesn't heat up as quickly. That's why you'll get a pint, 560 milliliters is a pint. That's, how, that's the size of a beer in a pub. When you get the, the draft, the shoppy, it's 
that size, or you can have half. You know, a curiosity, like uh, for you, a pint is 560 milliliters, but for us, a pint is 473. You're just being robbed of two mouthfuls of beer. That's what's happening there. Yeah, that's not a pint, unless it's 560. <laughs> you tell them, you're lying. <laughs> We're liars. I don't give like me the rest. Yeah, it's because I want to give a bigger bit. The way you measure beer in Brazil is quite strange for me because it's so simple in England. Pint, half a pint. <laughs> That's the options. Uh, for example, what you call a long neck is just a normal bottle size, and that's the other option. Cans are sometimes 440 or a pint, and it'll tell you before you buy 440 milliliters, which I think that's usually the size. And then they decide selling pint cans, so for 560, like you get in the pub, and that became quite cool for a while. As I said before, but I don't know the state of buying beer anymore because I've heard inflation has made everything so expensive. I've not bought a beer in England for, since before the pandemic last time I visited home. So I don't know what's, what the more recent trends are there with things, but that's how it was in the past. So in, in England, the, the beers are expensive now. Yeah, I've heard they're getting worse. I've re there was, it was always more expensive in London than everywhere else. I've heard pints of beer are five pounds in London. I think that's extortionate. Extortionate is like, this is expensive. This is very expensive. Extortionate somewhere over here. It's too much. <laughs> um, I think... People say £3.50 is a good beer price now. Uh, when I was 18, which would be 14 years ago, you would never pay £3.50 for a pint. It'd be £2.50 would be an average pint price. If you got less than £2.50, you were excited. Hmm. If you got closer to £3, you'd be like, you're beginning to rob me. More huh. than £3, you find another pub. But now £3.50 has become a reasonable price of a pint, and I think that's it's not good. And so that's what's happened. When you go out here in Brazil to drink, uh, what are the average prices you find there in, in Bahia to drink a good beer? Uh, depends. The sort of common beers you can sometimes... Depends on the neighborhood. If you're in a wealthier neighborhood, it's more. So, so for instance, Real Vermelho is a very nice place to go. The average beer price there for a, a Brahma Duplo Mall or a Bohemia is sort of 16 areas near where the good Baiana of a Carage is. So that's a good place to be because there's good food and the bars are quite nice, but it's a little expensive. You go to a part of neighborhood, you can get one for 10, uh, uh, the 600 milliliters. Um, I noticed the uh, better quality beer is maybe a slightly better price in the South and it's more readily available. So an artisanal, if you see, as it says there, or a craft beer. Sometimes a little cheaper than they are in Bahia just because there's more of them. I think... The competition is like, we charge too much for hours, people will choose the other one. When, when you're the only craft beer, you can kind of name your price a bit more without considering competition. So I think sometimes craft beer can be over 20 uh, or a 600. It depends it's where it is. If a place is a little fancier, more, more you pay. Uh, that's, I imagine that's the same everywhere. I would say that here, uh, the average price for a pint, and I'm talking about craft beer, the yeah. average price is at 20 bucks. Yeah, that's, that's quite reasonable if the beer is actually good. <laughs> yeah, uh, the and way it's here, so it's very easy to just choose a nice place, have a good variety of uh, craft beers you can choose. And by the way, here, uh, IPAs are very popular now. Yeah, I know they are. Uh, I think they taste like washing up liquid myself. Uh, I've even told my dad that. My dad likes IPA, but I think I, I like a porter or a stout, so Guinness would be the most famous one of these, and the darker ales. It's how long the, uh, the, the malt, or it's usually barley, has been toasted. You burn it to make stout, so it's black. You barely toast it. To make IPA, and I don't think it's that's right. That's my opinion. 
I, I know they're popular. Why it's so famous now? Uh, because here we can also hear about the A P A, not I P A. Yeah, the which is, uh, American one. Very oh. worse. <laughs> the American pale ale. Yeah, I don't I like that either. Taste to to please the majority of the people. So yeah. they reduced the bitterness of these beers to try, you know, really a bigger amount of uh, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, there is a lot of adaptation of stuff when it comes from abroad. They feel the need to make it more Brazilian, which sometimes doesn't always make it better. Uh, but they need enough people to buy it for it to be worthwhile to do. I find this happens quite often. Yeah, but that, uh, on the other hand, that's quite nice because then... Uh each country or sometimes even each state you visit where you can taste a different kind of craft beer it actually feels different and that's a different experience sometimes good yeah other times not so much yeah i think you spend too much time trying to copy other people instead of doing your own thing sometimes doesn't have the best outcome possible Yeah, but it has a lot of a lot to do with the um, environment, like you said. Here, the temperature is usually higher, so I think they think about that. Okay, let's make uh, fresher beers. I think that term is right. Yeah, you could say this. Yeah, a lighter as well. I would say. Yeah, lighter styles. The problem has been lighter here. Yeah. It's Gareth, the heavier uh, tech. Opportunity. Yeah. We should talk about food because I also wanted to know what are your favorite favorite uh, Brazilian foods. Now that we are around the time for lunch. Okay. Um. The, I, I do like the churrasco. The churrasco rodízios, I believe, are the that's the Brazilian food available in England as well. So that's quite popular. Mm -hmm. There are some churrasco rodízios. There's three in my city in England. I think there might be more now. Well, I don't know if the pandemic shut them or whatever. I know there's definitely been at least three opened there if we managed to survive all the uh, difficulties I've gone through recently. I do like a feijoada, uh, um, moqueca. I'm not a big fish eater, but moqueca is good for fish. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, one of the things that was local there that was quite good in Rio Grande do Sul is the alamanuta. Oh, that's local. I didn't know about that. Yeah. Yeah, that's local. There's the Prato Feto that you have everywhere, but that's a specific one there. Uh -huh. And the style's a bit different to the others. They're, they're, um, there's obviously the more expensive options, but for a reasonable priced lunch, it's the it's better value than a lot of the other things. It's good quality at a decent price. The food in Minas is generally quite good as well. Uh, didn't like the food in Florianopolis so when I went there. I, they had good beers there, but the food there is not good. <laughs> uh, everywhere else, um, further up the northeast, there's some good stuff. The Bios Dois is good. Um, Cani de Sol, something I generally like. The Cani de Sol Nonata, I had that in Recife. I think that's the best thing I've eaten in Brazil. That's uh, really good. And what about the The acarajé vatapá, have you, have you tasted them yeah. already? Yeah, acarajé, I eat acarajé about every week, usually. So I really do like acarajé. A barara I like, but the acarajé is better. Uh, have you eaten it yet, or you not being up here? I, I never uh, tried acarajé and vat or neither uh, vatapá, and I really want to, to try it sometime. Vatapá and cararú together are very good. They're good to mix. There's the full Comida Baiana you can get on a Friday. It's Friday special in a lot of more traditional restaurants. It's usually the kind working people go for their lunch break. They'll have the full Comida Baiana, so they'll have Shin Shin de Galinha. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but it's, it's good. And that comes mm -hmm. with Batapá, Cararu, uh, Black Eyed Peas in English, or Feijal Fraginho, Rice, Farofa, as uh, the quiet hot molio de pimenta, the molio de baiana, as it said. It's a spicier chili sauce than the others. So you get all this. It is the heaviest meal that exists. 
you eat this and you're not hungry again until like midnight if you have that for lunch. <laughs> it's very, very good. Uh, so if you're very, very hungry, it's like the best lunch you can get in Bahia generally. So yeah, I do like the very traditional Bahia food as well. The, the food of the North East, very good. Mean is very good. I actually think Rio Grande do Sul has good food and good beer. Not many places manage both. So North East isn't very good for beer, but it's very good for food. Minas kind of manages good beer and good food together, and so does Rio Grande do Sul. But somebody needs to give the Captain Arenzi some cooking lessons, because all that shrimp just give me a bad stomach. <laughs> in Minas? I, no, no, that's uh, Florianopolis when I was in Santa Catarina. I didn't like the food there. I don't know what's wrong with them. <laughs> uh, so, oh. When I've been there, I didn't see a lot of difference uh, between there and here, he went to Sul, but it was... There were a lot of similarities of the places, but the food, I uh, found, found everything was lots of shrimp and fried shrimp. I'm not really that into uh, seafood, and oh, we had to make pirau with no seasoning in, and pirau is very good everywhere else in Brazil, but the pirau doesn't taste of anything, so I thought, that's the weird, the food here, but... I did have a few beers there, and they were very good, the beers. They are good in making yeah. beers. Uh, one last uh, thing is uh, pão de queijo. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, pão de queijo is very, very good. And uh, can especially make the ones in minutes. Oh, but uh, you, you have to be careful yeah, when you... Yeah, the same way the carriage and everything else is delicious, though, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Man, that was really, really, really nice to get to meet you, and thank you so much for yeah. the invitation. Yeah, uh, likewise. And uh, the, we can schedule some more lives and with different subjects, not uh, other than yeah, that's, beer. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the thing people like. That's what people like. People always talk about what they like. Everyone likes food and beer. Everyone likes beer, but everyone likes food. How do you not like food? Anyway. Yeah, yeah it was nice to meet you. I'll, I'll see you some other time uh thank you for everybody who's watched this and made comments and got involved uh if you can give us both a follow this will be saved and there'll be links as there already was in the advert to see more materials that we both post okay comment aí pessoal aqui você tem de assunto nas próximas lives para a gente poder uh, atender você obrigado por todo mundo que assistiu yeah. até agora okay Bye-bye. Thank you. Ciao.